on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Good show tonight. Uh, we're talking about a, a difficult and often divisive issue. We're talking about abortion, and it is front and center this year in the Tennessee legislature. Uh, Governor Bill Lee has said he is going to advance a heartbeat bill, a bill that would ban abortions if a heartbeat is detected. Now, that has not been written yet. The language is not there yet, but we're going to talk about what that means. There's certainly going to be a court challenge should the legislature passes that, and just what are the implications for this proposal from Governor Lee. Happy to have with us tonight the Executive Director for Tennessee Advocates for Planned Parenthood, Francie Hunt. Thank you for being here. Good to be here. Um, of course, we talked to all sides of this issue. You are very much opposed to this bill. That's right. Um, what what would I'm going to ask what Planned Parenthood Tennessee Advocates for Planned Parenthood is in a moment but what what is your concern about this bill there are so many things that we're concerned about it's hard to pick just one I mean I think um, one of the main reasons is that it is blatantly unconstitutional and fiscally irresponsible I think that's something that even Tennessee right to life agrees with us on which is ironic um, you know there's you know when when you have something a bill that's being passed uh, to defy the Constitution outright, um, it's going to cost the taxpayers a lot of money to defend that. That's what you're talking about. Legislation, it, it, yeah. It, when you say fiscally irresponsible, what you're talking about is the lawsuits that are going to follow. Exactly. The state will have to, if the state passes this, then the Attorney General will defend it. There'll be lawsuits trying to stop it. The state would have to defend it. That'll cost a lot of money. Right. I mean, it is kind of curious to think how lawmakers are purposefully trying to pass legislation that they know is unconstitutional. In and of itself, that's a big question mark. But, you know, underlying, we're also opposed to it because it's, um, it does not allow those uh, pregnant people to be able to make their own medical decisions. And, and, you know, regardless of where people stand in terms of their own feelings about abortion itself, from a policy standpoint, from a political standpoint, uh, it's important to to think about this in terms of power and in whose uh, decision-making power should it be and it is very much our position that any decisions regarding a person's pregnancy whether it's giving up for adoption or caring to term or terminating a pregnancy needs to be left up to that uh, pregnant person and, and her family her faith her doctor but definitely not to politicians um, and nobody asked Governor Bill Lee or the General Assembly for their opinion. We don't ask for their opinions whenever we go to the doctor and if we have health issues. So uh, that is something where we feel that that relationship between that physician and uh, patient is critical and sacred, really. What would this mean realistically? And I know it's going to be challenged in court, but let's say it passed and, and it becomes law. What does it mean? When when would it? When is a heartbeat detected? I mean, at what point would this ban abortions? How how do you define a heartbeat? I guess. What 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 does it realistically mean if this were to uh, go into place? Well, I think uh, if for anybody who actually saw or read about uh, the governor's announcement of this, and and by the way, it is an interesting question to think about. And I'll, this is a question for everyone. What is the motivation behind hosting a press conference about policy that has not yet been written? I mean, I, I just find that I have to pull it to the infrastructural level. Like that's, I think, pretty irresponsible. If you're if you're talking about women's health and how to really support families, I think th that we need more thoughtfulness in terms of how we uh, provide that. But to your question, you, we saw. Uh, Governor Lee with other legislators there and they say their intent behind this bill is to outright uh, ban abortion. It is an outright ban so uh, the whole you know once the fetal heartbeat is detected and six weeks I mean, six weeks and that kind of terminology is a, is a little bit of a misnomer because again the intent is to make it completely illegal and to criminalize abortion. That is, that's what you believe the intent is. That's that's what they. That's what they say. And and yeah. what have other <laughs> yeah. what have other states done? Has this been passed in other states? And 
what is it meant in those states? Uh, in every state where this has been tried, it has been found unconstitutional. So please keep in mind me saying that it's unconstitutional and fiscally irresponsible is not just a Planned Parenthood talking point. That's You can ask almost anyone, including Tennessee Right to Life, that is an actual fact. Uh, you know, 45 years ago uh, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court held that states may not ban abortion before viability. Uh, for any reason and since then the Supreme Court has repeatedly reaffirmed this conclusion including Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992 and most recently in 1916 or 12, 2016 pardon me uh, with Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt so a ban on abortion before viability regardless of any exceptions is blatantly unconstitutional and this line is so clear that no court has ever upheld an early abortion ban as much as the law on abortion has changed in the last four Forty-five years, this central holding that categorically states may not ban abortion before viability remains steady. And that's essentially what's going on now. The battle is, obviously there's a large number of people who would like to just ban abortion, but what we're seeing in legislatures and that kind of thing is bills that are being passed that would go to the Supreme Court to begin to chip away at at Roe v. Wade and, and at abortion. Is right. that right? Well, and here's here's some, actually most people don't want to ban abortion, and it's not even a lot of people. 72% of Americans want to see Roe v. Wade remain the law of the land. Um, and every in every state there has been uh, no move to uh, outright uh, ban abortion the way we've been seeing in, in, in here. And so um, every every state has been fighting these, these restrictions that are wholly unconstitutional and really disrespectful. So again, I want to delineate um, how individuals may feel about the, the, the abortion in and of itself and uh, delineate that from the actual policy of whose decision is it to be made. And that's what we're arguing here. We think that those decisions are so personal and private, they need to be left up to the women. So to your question of like, what's the impact? When in countries and in times where abortion has been illegal, it actually doesn't eliminate abortion. It just makes it illegal and therefore unsafe. And women die. And we don't want to go back to those days. We, and we won't go back. And are you seeing a lot of these kinds of bills that, that people are saying, well, that's not quite going to pass muster. That's going to be struck down by a court. But it's just, are we seeing a lot of bills that are being passed simply to challenge Roe v. Wade as kind of a the beginning of trying to overturn this? And they're coming at it from lots of different angles. Right. And, and you know, another word of saying challenge is to undermine the Constitution. They're, they're, they're purposefully... Uh, trying to pass laws that will undermine our our constitution that upholds this privacy for medical provision that in this particular instance is impacting women but really it's a privacy infringement for all patients and and we see things like this I mean even with um, I guess it was a, a couple years ago was it a year ago my, my time starts blurring together uh, in Tennessee they passed legislation that for patients that are on Medicaid or TennCare that they could not receive fam family planning services at providers that uh, provide abortion. Well, you know, the contradiction there is that, you know, Planned Parenthood does not receive any public dollars for abortions anyway um, because of the Hyde Amendment and here in, in Tennessee we, we opted out of um, any kind of uh, Title X program. Uh, and so, but people come to us because we provide non-judgmental care and they know that they can get really excellent uh, family planning and birth control contraceptive services and so the very people that we want to make sure that we can reach out to and have access to those services are the very folks that they're stripping away those rights. So it's not just abortion, I guess that's my point. They're not just limiting access to abortion, they're limiting access across the board for reproductive and sexual health. Mm -hmm. From the very experts like Planned Parenthood who, that is our expertise. We have uh, four health centers in Tennessee. We've got two health centers in Memphis, one in Nashville, and then one in Knoxville. And we provide a full range of health care services, uh, including, uh, you know, uh, 
family planning services, STI, STD uh, testing and treatment. Uh, we provide trans care services. We also Another service outside of the health center is we are uh, one of the largest providers nationally for uh, comprehensive sexuality education. We, we are, and I mentioned the healthcare piece and the sex ed piece to say, we're doing everything that we know science demonstrates as being impactful to actually reduce unintended pregnancies. And so, you know, I would invite, I, I, I'm really looking for opportunities to uh, reach across the aisle and work towards solutions that impact everyday people in their everyday lives. And the alarming thing to me and to us as Planned Parenthood about this really hateful piece of legislation is that the, the undercurrent behind it is, is very divisive. You know, when you, again, back to the, this reality that what policymaker holds a press conference about a policy that has not been yet written and it and, and it just speaks to the fact that this is highly politicized and that's the motivation behind it and we're saying you know if you're going to pass policy let's pass policy that actually helps people I you know we're in a community and in a country right now that is deeply divided and if and if we love America we have got to figure out how to work together because we've got a lot of work that has to be done to make our communities better for our families and for our children and that's what that's the conversation I'm interested in having at the and legislature. You're saying you want to you want to reach across um, I guess lines and, and yes and find um, common ground this seems like one of those debates where there's just not a lot of common ground you have one side that's that's saying, um, you know, any abortion is, is taking a life, and another side is saying you know, you're taking away the rights of, of that person uh, to make a, her own medical decisions. And and these two sides have fought tooth and nail forever. What is the common ground? Be uh, optimistic. Sure. <laughs> what, what is the common ground here? How do these two sides that are so passionate in their views? find something that's that's common yeah any purpose any person that's serious about reducing the unintended pregnancy rate which for our opposition also you know for their purpose also result in reduced abortions um, knows that the best way to combat that is through a lot of sexuality education and and that when I say that, I mean not only your anatomy and physiology and knowing about birth control, you know, in the parts of your body, but also healthy relationships and understanding what your values are and how to how to have um, very uh, way way medically accurate information in your decision making and empowering individuals uh, to make the best decisions for their health care and we know there's direct lines between education and health health outcomes not only related to sexual health but across the board so sex education and sex education is a fundamental place where resources and time and energy needs to be spent and also on family planning services and making sure that access to birth control uh, and health care overall uh, is is um, met and I think those are common ground places that we could operate and you know I will say also investing in uh, health care access and making sure I mean I you know I, I, I think that there's a lost opportunity to not expand Medicaid which would bring in um, you know federal dollars which currently we're you know uh, turning away billions of dollars and, and we're and I just think that that's irresponsible you mentioned there are four, are there four Planned Parenthoods in all of Tennessee? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what is the access now for abortion in Tennessee? I mean, if you don't live in one of those areas where there's a Planned Parenthood, it could, you could be far, far away from, from a place where you could even uh, get one. Is that right? right? right. I mean, so wh where, where is Tennessee right now when it comes to access for abortion? And I mean, I think, I think people might be surprised there are only four. Mm -hmm. You know, they might think there's one you know, you hear about Planned Parenthood well, so there's much. Well, there's four Planned Parenthoods, the and then there are other private pro providers as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So wh where, where do we stand right now for access to abortion in Tennessee? Well, you know, I think um, we, after the, in 2014, a little, little uh, history, in 2014, we narrowly lost a ballot initiative, um, which 
uh, gave the legislature the constitutional authority to restrict or ban abortion for any reason. So since 2014, we've been barraged with a multitude of anti-abortion bills. And, and from that, we saw a 48-hour mandatory waiting period, which means that if you're a patient seeking an abortion, rather than uh, seeing that physician and getting your um, procedure th that day, uh, you have to go in twice and you have to wait 48 hours. So it requires a two-day visit, um, which for many people that means taking off work, finding care for your children, and, and keep in mind too, I have to say, um, most people who have abortions are parents. They already have children. And so one of the efforts, and I want to invite listeners to participate if they go to our Twitter page or Facebook, uh, they'll, and they just have to look up Tennessee Advocates for Planned Parenthood, pinned to our pages uh, is an open letter uh, to Governor Lee, and it's from parents and caregivers and family members. And um, in that letter, we talk about that for us being able to determine the, the size and the spacing of our children is a way for us to make sure that our, our families um, are taken care of in the best possible way. So, um, so since that passed in 2014, yeah. would you say access to abortion has gone down in Tennessee? Yes, yeah, I think, it, I think it's uh, becoming more and more dangerous. We see um, not only the 48 hour, but they also did a politically scripted informed consent. So any physician for any medical procedure, they, you, you have to sign consent papers. You can't you know, get stitches without them telling you what the risks are or whatever, right? Um, but they always treat, the legislature treats abortion completely differently and so uh, they created language that a physician has to say uh, that the legislature mandated versus like what a what a physician or a medical professional would know that needs to be said. So um, we've we've seen uh, that come down the pike. Uh, you know the trigger law passed last year, which means that once uh, if 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 Roe v. Wade were to uh, be dismantled, that it would immediately go into effect here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, the whole like this whole strategy or whatever for this for this bill that's, um, that the governor has put forward, it, it's just so full of holes and, and question marks um, as to why why you would do that. So, all right, we have to take a break. Yeah. Um, we have a couple calls. Anna, John, others, hold on the line. Uh, we'll take a break. We'll come back. We'll start taking phone calls. If you want to join in the conversation, there is the number, 615-737-PLUS. 615-737-7587. Take a break. We'll be back right after this.